On the Brain Possible podcast, we are committed to bringing you information, resources, and voices that you can use along your journey with the exceptional child in your life. Today is no exception. And today will be especially fun because we get to talk about the value of play. Our guest today is Ali Tickton, pediatric occupational therapist, author of Play to Progress, and founder of Play to Progress in LA and virtual, a play-based learning center. Allie uses the science of child development and the joy of play to boost children's confidence and enhance development within all areas of their life, from social and emotional to physical and academic. Ali believes that the best way to support children is by arming their parents from inception with the knowledge and skills necessary to encourage their child's development for success through childhood and beyond. We're excited to learn from Allie today. Let's get started. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Allie. Um, Thanks for having me. Um, can I always like to start with the why. Can you share why you chose play and sensory development as your life's work? That's a really good question. And I think the answer is it chose me. When I think of my childhood, I was always drawn to kids from the time I was really, really little. I was always playing with dolls. Like I'm talking two years old, like always had to have baby dolls, always playing with kids, you could always find me around the kids. And as I continued to grow up, I was always just working with kids in a different capacity. And I was also extremely playful. I didn't necessarily have the easiest childhood. My, you know, my family definitely went through a lot of trials and tribulations growing up, but I still always found play regardless of what we were going through in that moment. And I think that for me, it was almost like this grounding force. And I always kind of found myself coming to kids and, you know, I thought, okay, maybe I'll be a pediatrician. I didn't quite know where I fit Mm -hmm. until I found OT. And that was it. The minute I found OT that I knew that is exactly where I belonged. Now, I still didn't know sensory was where I belonged within the world of OT. I knew I wanted to be a pediatric OT, but it wasn't until going into OT school and finding sensory that I was like, this is it. Sensory has this beautiful merge of both play and science. It's completely rooted in science and development. And I was able to get that intellectual side of it that I absolutely love but it's also playful and fun and constantly brought me back to my childhood and back to my years as a camp counselor and allowed my creative side to come out as well. So I, it's just genuinely the best because I get both the side of me that loves science and this playful and creative side of me. Oh, that's the best when you find like all of your passions merging together and see you know, what you eventually became yeah. and that you use, you can use them all. Totally. Totally. Um, well, I've said this before to people who've come onto the podcast and I continue to say it and be inspired by people who are playful because I'm not naturally a playful <laughs> person. I feel like I, I grew up and tend to be very serious. I don't know why I, that's the way I wound up being. But um, interesting. And it's something that I work on a lot with parents is like, let's pull out your, I always call it your inner camp counselor. And maybe I call it that because I spent a lot of years as a camp counselor, but pulling out that inner child in order to engage and play with your child Mm -hmm. is not only an incredible way to bond with them, but it also tends to be really cathartic for parents. It is, it is. I think it's, it's something that, um, we should all incorporate into our lives because it just helps us to be, you know, more relaxed in our bodies. Um, and getting rid of stress kind of helps like that. So what are the eight senses you're talking about sensory? What are the eight senses and why are they important for a child's development? Yeah, good question. So everyone kind of is familiar with 
five senses. And then when I say, wait, we actually have eight people kind of look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but we have these three hidden senses. And my joke is I will never retire until everybody knows that we have eight senses, not five, but let's okay. go into kind of what <laughs> Let's go into kind of what these three senses are. So our first hidden sense is our vestibular sense. It's our sense of movement. Our second hidden sense is called our proprioceptive sense. This happens to be my favorite sense. And it's our sense of where we are in space, but it also proprioceptive input, which is like heavy work, how also happens to be incredibly calming. So it's an incredible tool if your child is having a rough day or a tantrum, we really will turn to proprioceptive input. It has an incredible way to ground the body. Then we have interoception. There's actually some debate if interoception is its own sense, but for our purposes, we'll call it that. And interoception is our internal awareness. So can I feel that I have to go to the bathroom? You can imagine right. a big one for potty training. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> How could Huge. we not have that as a sense? <laughs> Exactly. So that's a huge one. Do I know? Can I feel that I need to go to the bathroom? Can I feel that I'm hungry? Do I understand the difference between the grumble of hunger and the butterflies of nervousness? Mm. So all of that internal awareness you can imagine how that has such an impact on a child's self-regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, those all have really big names. So I actually feel like you need to break them down a little bit more. And what do you mean by heavy work? Do you mean lifting heavy things? This is the best question. So proprioception is our sense of where we are in space, but the input itself. So proprioceptive input, which is heavy work. So what I mean by that is it's any force against the muscle. So I'm pushing, I'm pulling, I'm climbing, I'm crashing. So anything I will often describe it to parents, like think about, is it going to build muscle? Is it like this force against the muscle? If the answer is yes, then that's proprioceptive input. So you can do it in a variety of different ways. Something like having your little one put some cans in a laundry basket mm -hmm. and have your little one push that laundry basket. So the resistance pushing that laundry basket across your carpet Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard, mm -hmm. but that is going to give them proprioceptive input, which is then incredibly calming and will really help ground their body. So it's a great tool. Say you just went to a birthday party. There was a bounce house and cotton candy and cake and all the goods, but now it's nap time. Mm -hmm. And we all know that transition from birthday party to nap time is not the easiest. Mm -hmm. And so rather than just going right from birthday party to nap time, build in some of that heavy work, some of that proprioceptive input. So you'll go, okay, we're going to come home. I want you to do a few things for me. Can you go find eight red things? And then maybe you add some heavy red things into these eight red things that you'll add as well. Put them in a laundry basket and have them push the laundry basket all the way to their bedroom from the kitchen. Hmm. Maybe you have wet clothes in the washer and you say, before we take a nap, I need you to help me. Will you help me take all the wet clothes out of the washer and put them in the dryer? That's hard for a little while. Yeah, it is. Can you imagine that? Like wet clothes, if you think of me, I think of myself doing laundry. Sometimes you're like really pulling at those wet clothes to get them Ooh. out and into the dryer. So you can imagine for our little ones, that's a lot of heavy work. That's mm -hmm. intense. Yeah. So um, that's definitely something to do as well. We want to build it in, in moments where honestly, I, initially where I was going with that sentence is in moments where we want to help our children regulate. But as I was saying, and I was like, you know, we want to just always build it. Right. Because right. If we can preemptively build it, and I always talk to teachers about this, let's make sure we're breaking up the school day with heavy work and giving them opportunities to move mm. 
in order to help a child stay grounded and regulated. It's extremely powerful and it happens to be something that I need and my personal body needs a lot of, which is why it's my favorite sense um, in something that I turn to frequently. Yeah, it reminds me of um, at the gym, pushing those, uh, pushing things. Oh, you know what I mean? The sled thing. Yeah, the sled thing at the gym. <laughs> And think of how good you feel after the gym, you yeah. know, like after all that heavy work. So yeah. yeah, I just recently started lifting again and it does feel good. And I can notice that I'm smiling a whole lot when I'm at the gym and after. Right. Yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> even though it hurts. <laughs> yes. So um, I have some more questions about sensory um, but before I dive into those like little specific ones, um, can you tell me in your work, how common are sensory challenges, especially in kids who are neurodiverse? That's a really good question. So what I really believe about the sensory system is we all have our, our sensory things, I'll call them. Like as I sit here, I will always have a hair tie with me. Because for me, I struggle to sit for a long period of time. And so I need something that's my own. This is my own sensory tool mm -hmm. is a little fidget. I found a way to make it functional. It's a hair tie or a hair clip that I always have with me mm -hmm. whenever I'm going to be required to sit for more than 20 minutes. So we all have our own sensory differences. And I think it's really important to normalize that because we all have our own sensory system. Mm -hmm. And my passion is to really help teach parents about their child's sensory system, because the more we can incorporate and understand the sensory system, incorporate it into our daily lives, incorporate it into the classroom, have flexible seating in classrooms, have what I call sensory toolboxes. So you have a toolbox in the classroom where the kids have access and they're taught that when your body needs something, you just walk over to the toolbox and you get it. Maybe it doesn't work for you to sit right on the carpet. That's okay because we have these six other chair options mm -hmm. that you can sit in. So I really believe that we all have our own sensory differences and then they're really on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So some kids have them in a way that it's really impacting them much more. Other kids maybe just, you know, don't like the, don't like the texture of one particular thing, mm -hmm. you know, but we all have our little, our little sensory needs. And I think the more that we can understand and talk about the sensory system and really change our classrooms to be more flexible mm -hmm. and incorporate, incorporate more sensory input and help kids learn about their body and their own sensory needs. I think that it's, that's my goal. And I think the more we can do it, the better it's going to really help children stay regulated and a child cannot learn unless they're regulated. That is the foundation. If a child isn't regulated within their body, they're not going to be able to access their, their education. They're not going to be able to learn math or reading or listen to the directions and process them mm -hmm. or, you know, even engage with their friends. It all starts. The regulation is really the very, very base and the most important thing. So the more we can help children understand their body and their own sensory needs, mm -hmm. the better. So to answer your question, I believe we all have our we own need sensory them. needs, but um, there is a big, there's a big spectrum and it, since, you know, some kids are far more impacted than other kids. Okay. So, well, two questions. One, I'm curious what your ideal dream classroom looks like that incorporates all that now that you said that? That's is a wonderful question. Thank you for asking this. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you just gave me an opportunity to say it. So um, I think for me in every classroom, and I'm not a teacher, 
I'm an OT, but we would see different seating options. So we kids spend a lot of time um, learning on the carpet mm-hmm. in circle time. Some children don't have the postural stability to hold themselves up in circle mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And um, little like something so simple, like, you know, you've probably seen the meditation chairs and the cube chairs that have the back, like the back jacks. Those are awesome. You can just have some of those around the classroom and teaching the kids that you take what your body needs. And then also um, a calming corner in every preschool classroom, I think would be amazing. And this calming corner would be a space where we teach children, you can go here to to calm your body. So there's no sensory inputs, fully enclosed, no bright lights, Mm -hmm. nothing. And it's really a place that they can go to get away from sensory input and reset and calm. Mm -hmm. I think the other big thing, and I always joke about this, but a lot of times you will walk into a classroom and you'll see like these huge, bright, motivational posters. And they're amazing because They have such great slogans on them, but sometimes they can be very overstimulating visually. (laughs) And so um, I think one thing to keep in mind is, and this is, doesn't just go for a classroom. This actually goes for at home as well. And as I'm talking about this, I'll say, I, I would love for every house to have a cozy corner where a child can go and get away from sensory input and regulate and these little corners I'm talking about can be like the tiniest little space that you would, would just sit there and collect cobwebs, but little kids can really fit in these spaces. And, um, okay. Now I know I'm jumping around, but back to the the space, (laughs) you said the chairs, which I I can't quite picture. I know I have a meditation cushion, but not one with a back, but you, you said different types of chairs, a calming corner which could be just a large box, right? A calming corner, which could be, it's interesting. So what I'll often describe is if you're at home, like that space between the couch and the wall, that's kind of just the dead space. That's a really good little space to create calming corner. At a school, I can often walk into a classroom and find like the tiniest little nook that there's just kind of stuff shoved in and instead take that stuff out (laughs) Or maybe it's just, you know, a little bit of a dead space and um, just put some cushions in it Mm -hmm. and you want it really tight and really enclosed because we want it small with very minimal sensory inputs. So keeping it really small and enclosed. So just the tiniest little space, it doesn't have to be, I think sometimes, you know, classrooms often are tight on space and they don't have space for something like a teepee or a tent and mm-hmm. that's okay. We, we don't need that. I saw it in one classroom. This was amazing. This teacher had this little, it was like a built-in cabinet and mm-hmm. under the built-in cabinet was just empty space that you, you really couldn't do anything with it. And so she put a cushion in there and then kind of created a little like with fabric, like a little door to it. Mm-hmm. And the kids used it as a calming corner and it was incredible. It was in a first grade class. It was amazing. So any (laughs) little space like that. Um, And then going to kind of visual inputs and organization. So really minimal, minimizing things that are on the wall. When we have a lot on the wall, it, it can get really, really overstimulating. We want everything to be put away in a cabinet, you know, ideally, or in a bin where it's not out and cluttered because that visual clutter can be extremely overstimulating. I also really like creating environments where that lead to independence with the kids. So Ikea makes these bins. They're, I love those. You know what I'm talking about, right? They're so inexpensive, but they're amazing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so at Play to Progress, we have, we use those bins. We have them in every single size. In fact, I just went to Ikea this weekend to try to get more and they were out and I was 
devastated. <laughs> but um, we, I'm sure they'll be back in stock soon and I will be buying more, but every single toy is in a bin. And then you can put a picture of what that toy is. So we have every single thing labeled. So you'll, you can put a picture of what it is. So it naturally leads to independence. What's even better than just a picture is as the kids are getting older, you can also put, you can label it. So say it's animals. You have a picture of animals and I'm going to get really specific here. I personally, with that picture, like a printed out kind of picture that's really minimalist. So it's not, the picture itself also isn't overstimulating. Yes, and then yes. You put a label on it. So as your kids are starting to learn to read, they see that picture of animals, they see the word animals under it. And mm-hmm. it also leads to this independence that I know where to get the animals. I pull them out and I can put them in and there's no visual clutter. That sounds so beautiful. We- I really want to minimize visual clutter. If you walk into a plate to progress, you will see everything, a lot of bins all organized on the shelf. Everything kind of has a place and that can seem hard, but remember, you know, when it, you don't need a lot of stuff at home when it comes to toys, when we're talking about this and in a classroom, it definitely can be a challenge to organize it, but is so well worth it. Hmm. Reminds me a little bit of like, I'm picturing like Montessori style classrooms because you want independence and you also want minimal stuff Exactly. (laughs) all over the visual stuff. And it sounds nice. I think a lot of people tend to just, well, in today's society, it's more and more and more and more layered on, layered on. Right. And I think that it's, it's an interesting concept, the, the more, 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 because I think we're kind of fed these like ads and different things yes. and parents feel like I need that toy. And, oh my goodness. This, what about this one that is being told yes. that I need on Instagram and that one and this one in the reality is reality is if we take it back to our childhood mm-hmm. and the toys that we played with in these very minimalist toys. Like I always say, what I said earlier, I found my passion for working with kids, playing with dolls as a child. Mm -hmm. I loved playing with dolls. Nowadays, our toys, they play for our children Mm -hmm. rather than with our children. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is I have, if you have a dog and your toddler just has to push it and it walks and it barks, And there you go. I just pushed it. It walks and it barks. What does your little one have to do? Versus if you just have a stuffed dog, your little one actually has to use their body to move the dog and they have to make that barking sound Mm -hmm. versus just pushing a button. Okay. So you recommend toys that are open-ended and never require batteries, as you said why can you speak a little bit more about why and give our listeners some examples or recommendations for great toys for young kids? Absolutely. So I am, you know, a big believer that we want to pick toys that our little ones have to play with rather than toys that play for our kids. So like I just mentioned with that dog, Think of something, the same is true, like with a car. So if your child just has to push go on a car, typically an electronic car will just move forward. It's not even going to move back or all around. But if your child has to take that car on its own adventure, where is that car going to go? It's going to go through your living room. It's going to go through the kitchen, might end up somewhere like the kitchen counter driving on it. Mm -hmm. It can go all these different places that it is not going to go when you just push that button. And your child has to think of what am I going to do with this car versus just push the button. Okay. So I have a couple questions here. One, going to an even younger age than someone who can push a car. Um, A lot of babies are given, you know, before they're even born, (laughs) 
everything electronic now they yeah. can like move like they're in the womb and everything's dancing in front of them well how do you feel about all that thank you for this <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're hitting on all my things that I believe so strongly in so really if you think of how we want a baby to move through development we want them to move through their natural process of development what does that mean? We don't want them in all these contraptions. I refer to them as containers. Mm. Um, and the reason is because we, these items, these containers put your baby often in positions that your baby can't hold themselves. Mm-hmm. So take something like, um, kind of like a bumbo where they're sitting up and they're sitting up all, you know, squished in this thing. Right. I'm so excited to hear what you think about these things. Cause <laughs> I have seen lots of PTs who like to use those things. The, they're like sitting in this thing, their body is in, not in the best posture, but also they're not ready to be sitting up yet. Yeah. The best <laughs> place for them is on the floor doing tummy time safely. So with you there with them, Mm -hmm. or, you know, if, you know, we all kind of need somewhere sometimes, or kind of somewhere like a baby be born where they're just laying back. We never want them in a position that they can't hold themselves. Mm -hmm. So the walkers and the jumpers, and then coming to your question about the electronic things, Oh, there's a lot of baby toys out there that you push it and it lights up and it makes all this noise. Yeah. I'm sure, you know, can think of exactly. Yeah. Like a jumper toy. and it's got a million different <laughs> buttons to push and play music and, and, and lights. Yeah. And even just, even before the jumper, like right when they're born, there's little toys you can put in your diaper bag that you push and instead of shaking the rattle, they have like, push this rattle and oh the keys yeah they have everything like push it and it makes noise push it and it lights up there's all of that stuff um that can also be really overstimulating for a baby Mm -hmm. and I think that's also an important thing to realize we really really want to try as much as possible to avoid any toy that requires batteries and instead bring out the wooden toys, the toys that are really, really simple. They're also Mm -hmm. tend to be really beautiful. So they look good in the house, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but bring out those toys, not, we don't want anything that is loud and lights up or places your baby in a position that they can't hold themselves. So I wanted to ask if my follow-up question is um, it's to me a little bit more sensitive because I, my second child had a brain injury and he, mm-hmm. I don't know what developmental age he, he was 20 months when he passed away, but he, you know, functioned like an infant. And so he wasn't able to, you know, crawl over and push a car or do things like that. But I had a fascination with toys. And that's, he is the, the catalyst of why I started caring so much about health and children's health and wellness. And mm-hmm. I just have gone deeper and deeper and deeper over the years. But I had a fascination with going in and finding toys. And I would think like, is what's the toy that will he'll be interested in? And so I'd love those like boutique toy shops. And I would get a lot of wooden toys. One of my favorite toys that someone told me to get one time I had to buy on eBay, but it was, do you remember that old Fisher price apple from like, it was just an apple and it just dings. So you have to push it and it just goes, makes a little jingle. Do you remember the happy apple? It's called happy apple. (laughs) I don't remember it, but it sounds, so you just push it over and it kind of, I have it in the other room. I might show (laughs) you because it is my favorite and I will never get rid of that toy. Um, even though he's no longer here and I don't have any babies, my kids see it and they're like, I'm like, be careful with that toy, (laughs) but it was so special. 
and that was a simple toy. But also I did, you know, fall into the trap of sometimes buying the keys and things that light up because that I would think maybe this would be more interesting for him. And I know a lot of other friends and people in this community, I'm sure fall into, well, my daughter can push the thing with the buttons and the lights and the music. And if that's all she can do, she can't move to push a car or something. They have a lot of the light up toys. So I wanted to know your thoughts, you know, in, in your experience with working with kids who maybe are stuck in a little bit more of that type of um, development where they haven't been able to move on. What kind of toys do you recommend there? I am definitely not an all or nothing person when it comes to anything. Mm -hmm. I think that when it comes to toys, yes, I I preach wooden toys and I, I love them and I'm big on try to avoid toys with batteries, but I also understand you're going to have one or two toys with batteries. And Mm -hmm. if there is something that really, really works for your child, use it. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying totally avoid it. Um, I think it's so important with any suggestion I make or anyone makes is take what works for you. Mm -hmm. And so pot some of what I'm saying it may not work for your child and that's okay too you know take what works for you yeah I guess I could think of like there was this other toy I don't think they make it anymore and I don't remember who it's by but it was like these flowers and you touched each flower and they could make a song if Uh there were different color flowers And I remember that being used, you know, if you could touch the flower, if you could just so slowly get over there to touch the flower. And I mean, so that's an example of if that toy works in your kid that gets them moving, then then that's great. Then that's great. But I also am a huge fan of the the non-toxic, pleasing, minimal, and having them be more basic. When babies are little and if they're developing you know, they're well, I think that's a kind of a different story a little bit because they don't need all the bells and whistles. You got it. Exactly. So I think that that is, is definitely, you know, meeting your child where they're at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So a parent out there might be wondering, how do I know if my child has sensory challenges? What do I look for and what do I do next? This is a really, really wonderful question. So how you know is, is any, is anything impacting? I would say, is something impacting their function? So when, like I said, we all have our own sensory things, but when something starts to impact their daily life, impact them at school, impact them with friendships, a big thing, I think that is important to mention in this question is parents often think of sensory challenges. I think the first thing that comes to mind is, is my little one okay getting messy? So they think of the tactile sense. Mm -hmm. Are they tactilely sensitive? Do loud noises bother them? Mm -hmm. And I think those are the two that um, are most easily understood. And that's why parents go to them. But what can also look like a sensory challenge is my child is in preschool and just hugging their friends to the point where their friends are like running away and like, no, Johnny, stay away, Johnny, stay away. Because Johnny's so excited and he's just going up to hugging them and hugging them or maybe like biting them. And he's getting proprioceptive input that way, possibly unaware of where they are in space. So they might bump into things, knock into things, struggle with coordination. They may struggle with movement. So it can look like the child who's kind of moving frequently and often, but it can also look like the child who is withdrawn and in the back of the class in the back of the playground and scared to engage on the playground equipment or jump into play, doesn't want anything to do with the swing. And you can see that they're kind of withdrawn 
that's also a, a piece of sensory. So sensory looks so different than I think what parents often think about. And that's what I want to do is I want to spread the word on we have these eight senses and this is what the sensory system really is. Mm. What I had a friend say to me the other day that their child, you know, they said, oh, he'll only wear this one pair of shoes and he has a lot of sensory things and he won't wear, we, we can't go skiing because he won't wear a snowsuit. Um, what do you recommend for something like that? This is a great question. And skiing is hard. Do you know how many pieces of clothes we have to put on our kids? <laughs> it is. It is it's so hard cool. when you don't have sensory challenges. Exactly. It can be a lot. So much. One thing I'm really big on is we never push a child. So when it comes to in introducing any sensory input, and I'm going to give you a really easy example is sand. So say if you bring your child to the beach for the first time and they are like lifting their feet up, they do not want to touch the sand. Right. Yeah. They're really, really avoiding the sand. A, what might be natural is to put them in the sand and be like, you got it. Look, it's fun. And like dance around in the sand. Uh -huh. But that's actually not what we want to do. Okay. We want to pull back put them safely on a blanket. If they feel safe on the blanket, it may be safe in your arms. They may not even be ready for the blanket. Then take something like a bucket mm -hmm. and hold it and show them playing with it and gently let them come to it. So just touching it with their hands, possibly even before that with a, with a um, shovel, anything and let them slowly come to that mm -hmm. sensory input and then move closer and closer to it as they get more comfortable. So when it comes to something like skiing, my initial thought is if this child is having an extremely hard time and is really struggling with these clothes is instead of forcing the clothes on them, practice before long, 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 long before your ski trip mm -hmm. at home, putting one piece on at a time, make it fun, let them come to it mm -hmm. and help them to feel comfortable and help them get there. Maybe they don't get there by the ski trip and that's okay. And they stay in the lodge mm -hmm. or maybe they are able to not put the ski boots on and they make it out to go sledding. But what we don't want to do is force anything on them to the point where they're extremely dysregulated and crying. Cause what you have to remember is it really feels bad in their body. Mm -hmm. This isn't a behavior. It actually feels bad in their body. They, it's really actually bothering them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, we don't force it. Instead, we really slowly come to it and we make sure to take off all anxiety with it. So what I mean by that is often I'll take an example of food, right? So if we are saying you have to eat X, Y, and Z to get the dessert, or you have to eat X, Y, and Z to go to the park, whatever it is, it's a lot of pressure to eat that food, to eat broccoli. Say you have to eat broccoli, to go to the park. Mm -hmm. And if a child is really struggling with the texture of that broccoli, then, you know, that's going to be really anxiety producing right. for them. So we want to remove the anxiety, remove the pressure whenever we're introducing any sensory input, any single thing, whether it's a swing, food, clothing, whatever it is. And instead acknowledge how they're feeling and be playful about it and help them slowly get to it, but make it crystal clear. You are not going to force them to put on the clothes or force them to eat the food, but make sure that they're coming to it on their own. No, oh, that's good. Thank you. I feel like that's probably when I heard that, I think that's probably common. Um, mm -hmm. one. Yeah is like clothing type things. Like you said, the tags or the texture of clothing. It's a more common one that we hear. 
And with tags, honestly, what I often say to parents is just remove the tags. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I prefer clothes, uh, companies that have picked that up by now and they don't have tags anymore. Yeah. Like if tags are really bothering your little ones, just cut them out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about Play to Progress. How did Play to Progress come to be an in-person facility? So Play to Progress, it's really my dream come alive. And it was a lot of happy coincidences. I think I said that wrong, but however you pronounce that word, <laughs> um, that all came together at once. And now it's here and we have these two locations in Los Angeles where we host a variety of classes, camps, and, and individual sessions as well, group sessions, where we are really able to teach parents the power of the sensory system and help mm -hmm. parents understand their child's development. Over COVID, we also launched a digital platform, which has been amazing because now we have parents who are all over the country and even in Canada that are able to join us for live parent in me classes and able to learn about their child's sensory, oh. their child's development all from the comfort of their home. So that has been an incredible underlying, of, un, you know, an incredible thing that came yeah. out this pandemic um and we have a toy so speaking of toys we have our very own toy it's called the animagnets that was a big dream of mine that probably started at 22 years old living on my best friend's couch while doing my field work in chicago and just getting frustrated at the toys available to me mm -hmm. while i was you know learning and working with kids and that was kind of when I had my first idea for a toy and now we have our Anna Magnus so that's been very exciting and um can you tell me about those yeah so they are FSC certified so they're made out of FSC certified wood and they are just really beautiful different animals there's three animals and okay. they you can mix and match them. So they have their heads and their bottoms and the kids can take them on any adventure they want. They can also make their own animal because they can take the elephant head with the zebra bottom and make it into their own animal. They can name that animal. Oh. They're beautiful wait. and they're really high quality. Wait, what did you say they're made out of? Are they wood? They're wood, yeah. No way. I've seen yeah. those, but they're like plastic and kind of junky looking, but I hadn't. Yeah. That sounds really awesome. So these are beautiful. They look beautiful on a shelf, which, you know, is a big thing for me. And it's they, a big thing for me too. Um, I have two jobs. One of them is a designer. <laughs> there you go. It's so, <laughs> so you get it. Yeah. Um, so, but they're also, they come with a guide on how to use them and um, they're just, it's, it was really a huge deal for me when we came out with this toy because I'm so passionate about toys and to create a toy that has all the qualities that I look for in a toy was awesome. Do they, is it a magnet? It's a magnet. So you can mix oh, and match so awesome. them and they're fun and kids love them. Where can we buy them? You can buy them on our website at playtoprogress.com, or we actually also have an Etsy shop that you can buy them on. Oh, fun. I love Etsy. You can find so many great wooden toys on there. Etsy is my go-to toy shop, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. People always ask me, where do you buy toys? The answer is Etsy. I am constantly looking at Etsy for new toys and constantly buying toys off of Etsy. Yeah. I have... Um... A couple years ago, I bought my son this um, tool bench and it, and all these little like tools with the real screws and actual, you know, wrenches and stuff. And it's so cool. 
they have the cutest stuff. I, for my nephew, for his birthday, a few years ago, I bought him a toolbox that says his name, mm-hmm. like, like a wooden toolbox and has the tools in it. It's so cute and, and fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what successes have you seen with those who visit your facility? Something we constantly hear is that parents understand their child's development better. Parents oh, feel that's more good. confident mm-hmm. as a parent. And I think that's a big one is parents want to understand their child's development and they want to feel confident. And I think that parents leave our classes feeling that way. And it all happens while their kids are having so much fun, which is awesome. So I think that is, for me, there's been a lot of successes, but that for me, I think is the, feels like the biggest success. Mm, I love that. Okay. For our listeners who are thinking about picking up your book, what can you tell us about what they might learn? Yeah, I actually have it right here. So, um, this book is all about our senses. So I really walk parents through their eight senses. I talk a lot about some of the things we talked about today, picking toys, organizing your space to help your child's regulation. And then there's over 90 different exercises that you can do at home. They're really simple to engage your child's sensory system. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an incredible book and has some great ideas, but also is filled with knowledge to help you understand your child's development. And many of the exercises have baby bonus activities. So you can do it with your little ones and your ones that are a little bit older. Oh, I love it. I've already been thinking in my head now, all the people that I want to get that, that toy for, for Christmas. Awesome. (laughs) Thank you. All right. Well, where can our audience find out more about you and your work? Yeah, so you can go to our website, play the number two progress.com. So that's play to progress.com. Follow us on Instagram at play the number two progress. And um, you can find us at any of those places. Join any of our classes on our digital platform. And you can also join us in person in Los Angeles at any, at either of our two locations. On your, about your virtual classes, do you pay per class or is it, do you have to have a membership? How does that work? Good question. It's a monthly membership okay. and you get unlimited classes. There's classes that are both recorded and live. Oh, okay. Awesome. All right. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the brain possible community today to be complete? No, thank you so much for having me today. This was awesome. Yeah, it was really fun talking to you. I love your energy and I love what you're about. Um, And you've created so many awesome things. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that you learned something new. Do you have a question for Ali? Do you have your own story to share? We would love to hear from you. Let us know how we can be useful in your journey. Email us at info at thebrainpossible.com. Be sure to subscribe, follow, and share our podcast if that feels true for you. You may also consider visiting our website for more information on stories, therapies, and products that we think that you will love. As always, thank you for spending your precious time with us at The Brain Possible. See you next week and be well.